let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, proud of our ancient heritage, and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. My lords, I'm going to start, I don't wish you to get too encouraged by that, I'm going to start with my conclusions, but I'm not going to sit down when I've made them, because I'm going then to give you the evidence to support them, and hopefully present to you the reasons why I want support for a, an official inquiry into the mischief I want to unfold to yourselves this afternoon. My lords, I've been engaged in this pursuit of this issue for nearly two years now, and I'm no further through to getting to the truth. I think there are three possible conclusions which may come from it. I think there may have been a massive piece of money laundering committed by a major government which ought to know better and that it has effectively undermined the integrity of a British bank, the Royal Bank of Scotland, in doing so. The second alternative is that a major American uh, department has an agency which has gone rogue on it because it has been wound up and has created a structure out of which they are seeking to get well, at least 50 billion euros as a payoff. And the third possibility is that this is an extraordinary elaborate fraud which has not been carried out, but which has been prepared in order to provide a threat to one government or more if they don't pay them off. So there are three possibilities, and this all needs a very urgent review. My Lords, it starts in April and May of 2009, 
with the alleged transfer to the United Kingdom, to the HSBC, of a sum of $50 trillion. And seven days later, ping, in comes another $50 trillion to the HSBC, and then three weeks later, another $50 trillion. Total of $5 trillion in each case. Total of $15 trillion is alleged to have been passed into the hands of HSBC for onward transit to the Royal Bank of Scotland. And we need to look to where this came from and what the history of this money is. And I have been trying to sort out the sequence by which this money has been created and where it's come from for a long time. It starts off apparently as the property of a man called Johannes Ryardi, who has some claims to be considered the richest man in the world. Well, he would be if all the money that was owed to him was paid, but I have seen accounts of his showing he owns $36 trillion in um, a bank, and it is a ridiculous sum of money. Uh, on the other hand, the $36 trillion would be consistent with the dynasty from which he comes and the fact that they had been effectively the uh, emperors of uh, Indochina in times gone by. But a lot of that money has been taken away from him with his consent by the American Treasury over the years for the specific purpose of helping to support the dollar. And he has sent to me a really quite remarkable document which is dated in February 2006 in which the American government have called him to a meeting with the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, which is neither Federal Reserve nor a bank. It's a bit like Celebrity Big Brother. It's got three names to describe it, and none of them are true. And the, this document, which is quite astonishing, purports to have been a meeting which is witnessed by... It is witnessed by Mr. Alan Greenspan, who signed for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, of which he was chairman, as well as the real Federal Reserve Bank in Washington. And it is signed by Mr. Timothy Geithner, who, who, as a witness on behalf of the International Monetary Fund, who sent two witnesses, the other one being Mr. Yasuki Horiguchi. And these gentlemen have signed as witnesses to the effect that this deal is a proper deal. There are a lot of other signatures on here. This is not a photocopy. This is a, an original version of the contract, under which the American Treasury have apparently got the Federal Reserve Bank of New York to offer to buy out the bonds which have been issued to Mr. Riardi to replace the cash which has been taken from him over the previous 10 years. And they're giving him half of uh, 500 million dollars as a cash payment to buy out worthless bonds. Now this is all in the agreement and it's very remarkable. Um, I would have thought establishing whether this is a correct piece of paper or not is just two phone calls away, one to Mr Geithner and one to Mr Greenspan, both of whom still prosper and live, so they could easily confirm whether they signed this. Mr Royardi has by passing these bonds over, also put at the disposal of the US Treasury the entire asset backing which he was alleged to have for the 15 trillion. I now have a letter here from the Bank of Indonesia which says that the whole thing was a pack of lies, that he did not have the 750,000 tons of gold which was supposed to be backing it, he only had 700 tons. And this is really uh, a piece of complete fabrication. Finally, I have a letter here from Mr. Bayardi himself, who tells me that he was put up to do this and it was none of it was true, and that he has been robbed of all his money. And I'm quite prepared to recognize that one of the possibilities here is that Mr. Riardi is himself putting this together as a forgery in order to go and try and win some recovery back. But it gets more complicated than that, because each of the five trillion payments that came in has been acknowledged and receipted by the senior executives of HSBC and again receipted by the executives of the Royal Bank of Scotland. And I have a set of the whole of those receipts for all of this money. Why would any bank want to sign five trillion pounds worth, five trillion dollars worth, 
15 trillion in total of receipts if the money didn't exist. The money was said to have come, first of all, from the Riyadi account to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, it was passed to J.P. Morgan Chase in New York for onward transit to London. The means of sending it was a swift note, which ought to have been registered with the Bank of England if it was genuine. So when this happened and came about, I first of all took it to my noble friend, Lord Strathclyde, and said, what do we do with this? He said, give it to Lord Sassoon, he's the treasury. So we did, and Lord Sassoon looked at it and said immediately, this is rubbish. It's far too much money. It would stick out like a sore thumb and you can't see it in the Royal Bank of Scotland accounts. Quite right. Secondly, he said, the gold backing it is ridiculous. There's only been 1,507 tons of gold mined in the history of the world, so you can't have 750,000 tons. Uh, this is true. And uh, the, the third thing he said obviously was, it's a, it's, a, it's a scam. And I agree with him, it was a scam. The problem is we stopped looking at that point. We should have asked, what is the scam, instead of uh, at that time just nodding it off. And we have never really resolved this, because today I have this quite quite easy piece of paper, which is my justification for bringing it into this meeting today, which is available on the internet, and I'm astonished that it hasn't already been unearthed by the Treasury, and every alarm bell in the land should be ringing if it has, because this is the General Audit Office of the Federal Reserve, the real Federal Reserve in Washington, and its audit review in Ju end of July 2010 on the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. It has on it some 20 banks listed, to which $16.115 trillion are outstanding in loans. My Lords, that is the sore thumb that was being looked for by Lord Sassoon. But more particularly, there are two other very interesting things with this. The first is that Barclays Bank have got 868 billion of loan. The Royal Bank of Scotland has got 541 billion, in which case one has to ask, as they could have earned in three weeks enough to pay off their entire indebtedness to the taxpayers in Britain, why they have not done so, and could we please ask them to put a check in the post tonight for the whole 46, min 46 billion. Uh, and the third thing that's wrong with it is that every bank on this list, without exception, is an MTN registered bank, which means that they are registered to use medium-term notes to move funds between themselves with an agreed profit share formula. In which case, these banks are investing this money and, most extraordinary, not a penny of interest does the Federal Bank of New York want paid on this vast amount of 16 trillion. Anyone amongst yourselves who knows what the IMF rules are will immediately smell a rat because the IMF has very strict rules for validating dodgy money. There are two ways of doing it. You either pass it through a major central bank like the Bank of England, who had apparently ref not refused to touch this, or alternatively, you put it through to a bank which is an MTN trading bank, and which is then able to use the funds on the overnight European MTN trading market, where they can earn between one and two and a half percent profit per night and the compound interest on that is huge. So there is a vast profit being made with this money somewhere if it is in fact genuine. So my Lord, I believe that this is such an important issue now that uh, I've put everything I've got on the subject into a 104 megabyte memory thumb and I want the government to put this to some suitable investigative bureau and take everything I've got on the subject and find out what the truth is of what is going on here because there is something very seriously wrong. Either we have a huge amount of tax uncollected on profits made or we have a vast amount of money festering away in the European banking system which is not real money, in which case we need to take it back. My Lords, I ask for an investigation and please support my, my plea.
welcome everyone to the White Hats Report 48 video series, both our longtime readers and followers and also our first time viewers. The long awaited Report 48 will cover primarily the corrupt financial system that very few out there are aware of and even fewer participate in and benefit from. Additionally, while drilling down on information and smoking out the rabbit holes, during our investigative process, we were able to identify the origins, participants, networks, and operations of the shadow government. We'll get back to the significance of Lord James's historic speech in the House of Lords, but first, a brief recap of the information put out from our White Hats Report archives. Our first White Hats Report was released in November 2010, nine years ago, and to date, we've published 66 reports, omitting Report 48 until now. As we've said many times before, timing is everything. We've exposed what we've, con what we've continually referred to as the cabal in our reports, but now you may also know them as the deep state. The center of the corruption and the control of the planet is derived by the money-changing central bankers using various legitimate appearing names such as the Federal Reserve, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the Bank for International Settlements. In addition to pursuing the world global settlements and providing documents regarding the theft of $4.5 trillion from former Ambassador Leo Wanta, we focused on two additional situations involving Edward Falcone and Tropos Capital Corporation. In our second report published on November 22, 2010, we disclosed a letter to President Obama from the Black Caucus regarding the theft of settlement monies not paid to Edward Falcone. In the letter, the author, the Honorable Walter Fauntroy, informs Obama that he has sent three pri previous letters by registered mail four months prior and has yet to receive the courtesy of even a response. The letter mentions RICO-level crimes committed by elected officials and bankers and mentions corruption in the administration and its ramifications for impeachment of the president. Real estate developer Ed Falcone approached Mitt Romney for assistance in gaining entry into a program that would stimulate funding for humanitarian projects. The project objectives included rebuilding New Orleans in the inner city areas of Miami after Hurricane Katrina. Falcone invested $350 million to generate these funds with the assistance of fraudster Michael Herzog and his Canadian co-conspirator Paul Jeanette, all referred to him through Romney by... Bush Sr. Falcone's money was put into a trading program, the proceeds of which have never been paid to him, the humanitarian projects remain unfunded, and the profits have been stolen. The invested millions continue to accrue vast trillions, all off balance sheet and thereby shielded from income tax levies. When Falcone went to then Vice President Joe Biden for help, Biden was paid a $200 million bribe by Bush Sr. via Hillary Clinton to look the other way and not pursue justice. An outright bribe that Fauntroy refers to in his Obama letter. The additional information imparted in White Hat's Report 2 tells the sordid tale of the criminals in the Obama administration, including Obama himself, scrambling to move Biden's bribe money in addition to Bush Sr.'s and others as investigators were closing in. Subsequent reports identify other co-conspirators, conspirators, including the then Gov Lieutenant Governor of Texas, David Dewhurst, and his CIA agent brother, Donald Nevins. The money was tracked, and Bush Sr. sent a team of agents on a U.S. government plane several times to travel to various overseas banks to start moving the ill-gotten gains to stay ahead of bank regulators and investigators. At the end of this same report, we dropped some tidbits of information regarding the theft of $700 billion from Tropos Capital Corporation. Mr. Falcone made 535 flash drives and presented them to each member of the House and the Senate in January 2011. He also sent a registered letter to Chief Justice John Roberts in January 2011, informing him of the corruption by a former and current president. So by the time the 112th Congress convened the same month in 2011, all three branches of government were notified of the theft of not only Falcone's funds, but the theft of the proceeds, the payoffs to executive branch employees, and the amounts, 
and the banks where they were located. And what happened? Nothing. Complete silence. Mr. Falcone did not stop pursuing justice, continuing his self-funded investigation, which eventually took him to Europe and Germany as one of Bush Sr.'s favorite money laundering banks was Deutsche Bank, run at that time by another Bush crime family stooge, Joseph Ackerman. During that trip, there were attempts made on Falcone's life and disclosed on June 6, 2012 in White Hat Report 42. This is an internal email received with information that was published in the aforementioned report. Falcone reported these attempts on his life to the FBI, but the director at the time, Robert Mueller, blocked attempts by local agents in Miami to pursue the investigation. All evidence has been documented, preserved, and ready for presentation to a grand jury should one be convened. It should be noted here that Mitt Romney was right in the middle of all of this, as he was then and still is another member of the Bush political family. Recently outed for having a clandestine Twitter account, rest assured that Romney is a deep stater and continues to be. It should be noted here that Sarah Palin was picked by McCain as his VP when Romney couldn't vet because of the $900 plus million dollar bribe he was paid by Bush Sr. To help for helping defraud Edward Falcone. And if you were wondering if Trump knows, perhaps this copy of an email message will answer that question. It was sent to Romney's 2016 presidential fundraiser in Florida, Meredith O'Rourke, and to Rom Romney's Mormon gang in Utah. Ms. O'Rourke was urged to do the right moral thing and return the money to donors as Romney had no chance, nor does he deserve one, of becoming president of the United States. However, since she was receiving a commission of 20% of donations, greed won out over morality and no funds were returned when Romney dropped his short-lived run for president. Trump knows both Romney and Biden have dirty hands when it comes to the theft of Edward Falcone's funds. November 2004, a money wire transfer was initiated from the Bank of Taiwan in China to Wachovia Bank in the United States on behalf of Tropos Capital Corporation of America, Inc. The amount of the transfer was $700 billion and the ACATS system was utilized to process the transaction. ACATS stands for Automated Customer Account Transfer Service and is a system that automates the transfer of in-kind assets from one brokerage account to another. Pre-advices were sent and the Federal Reserve had representatives at the Bank of Taiwan in China when the transfer was made. Somewhere along the trail from the Far East to the United States via the San Francisco Federal Reserve Bank and the New York Federal Reserve Bank, the money was hijacked and the transfer was never completed. Fifteen years later, the money has not been recovered and a healthy profit is still being generated from the $700 billion and paid to someone, but not Tropos Capital, its rightful owners. This money was earmarked for humanitarian projects to benefit the United States and in turn the rest of the world. Representatives from Tropos sent notices of default and notices of demand to the Board of Governors of the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank in addition to the Federal Reserve Banks of Richmond, Virginia, Dallas, Texas, and Atlanta, Georgia. Notices of default were also sent to the United States Bureau of Public Debt under postal authority rules in addition to the Postmaster General of the United States. The U.S. Comptroller of the Currency was also copied on all notices of demand and notices of default. The Bank for International Settlements was advised of this theft by a documented correspondence, and they replied that they have no authority over the Federal Reserve. 
A letter was sent to then Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke regarding this theft in addition to two letters sent to then President Barack Obama all with no official response, save for a lawyer at the Richmond, Virginia Federal Reserve referring tropos to the New York Fed, and as will be documented in later videos, the New York Fed is the head of the snake when it comes to the Federal Reserve criminality. Apparently, the Federal Reserve has more power than the presidency of the United States and can confiscate funds within its system with impunity and total disregard for lawful regulations and statutes. As stated earlier, the theft of these funds and the associated profits, most likely shielded from taxing entities through off-balance sheet accounts, needs to be investigated. So now let's get back to Lord James's speech that we showed a clip of earlier in this video presentation made on February 16th, 2012, since named White Thursday. During the months of November, December of 2011 and the first half of January of 2012, we hadn't released any reports. Uh, our first one in 2012 was the 16th, number 33. It was a short report letting everyone know we were still on the job and we gave everyone a warning to sit back and pop your corn because the parade was about to start. We elaborated two days later with some information coming out uh, that we'd been working on for the past few months. This paragraph was sort of a teaser of what was about to come next month in the House of Lords. And we've got to say that this was the culmination of over a year's worth of work and research. And that was condensed into a 10-minute presentation that Lord James gave in the House of Lords in February. And this was arranged and coordinated by our London team behind the scenes. Uh, we had to jump a four-month queue to get that slot. And it was one of those days we all were able to watch this live and, however briefly, uh, sit back and enjoy the fruits of our labor. Further on down in the last paragraph, we gave everyone a heads up to keep, keep a close eye and ear on the inner sanctums of Great Britain. James's speech, he referred to a flash drive that had documents on it to back up everything that he had reported in his speech. And this was one of the three $5 trillion SWIFT transfers that he referred to in his speech. As you can see, it was done April 20th, 2009. Uh, all three of these were done in consecutive weeks, April 20th, April 27, 2009, and the last one was done on May 4, 2009. They're all basically the same, except the dates are different. As you can see here, this was originated by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York to J.P. Morgan 
with further transfer to the Royal Bank of Scotland, and then further credit to LWR slash GOTSA slash Pure Heart Investments Limited. Now, it's interesting to note that the clearance code used for this was a UN permit number 04050, Homeland Security. So this gives you the indication that the U.S. government was fully aware of what was going on. And as any accountant knows, debits have to equal credit. So if you've got $15 trillion on one side of the balance sheet, you've got to, got to, offset, got to offset it with something. And that's where the 750,000 tons of fake gold came into play. As you can see here, Bank of Indonesia was part of the scam. They generated this SWIFT after all three SWIFTs for the 5T was transferred and 15T had been transferred. Then they come back on May 20th and send this SWIFT to JP Morgan, originated by the Bank of Indonesia, regarding 750,000 metric tons ore, and it goes through the troy ounces of gold to LWR, GOTSA, Pure Heart Investments through the Royal Bank of Scotland, and it also cites the UN permit number 04050, Homeland, which means Homeland Security. Please take this as my instruction to debit my account and transfer 750,000 metric tons of gold, okay? Now, this was confirmed two days later on May 22nd by J.P. Morgan. We hereby acknowledge receipt your SWIFT dated May 20th. So that completed the fraud. Now, speaking of fraud, let's go to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York website because, as we said before, they are the head of the snake. They're the ones who put out the fraud alerts. So let's scroll down, scroll down through these until we get to scams involving high yield investment programs, often involving private placement programs, slash medium term notes. In White Hat Report 63, we posted a trading program contract between Johannes Riotti and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, as you can see here. So the scam that they're saying is a scam is something that they themselves are participating in. Now you can read through some of these items here under the high yield investment programs basically they're trading programs but they use another name to make it sound like they're fraudulent i want to go down to this paragraph terms that have no meaning in legitimate financial transactions for example conditional swift key tested telex pay order funds of good clean clear and non-criminal origin master commitment one year and one day and commitment holder now, these first few uh, terms, conditional SWIFT, key tested telex, and pay order, you can go Google those and you can find by Black's Law Dictionary and financial um, websites that these are, in fact, real legitimate financial transaction terms. Now, this one here, funds of good, clean, clear, and non-criminal origin is my favorite. Here is an affidavit of due diligence done on Federal Reserve Bank letterhead, Bank of New York, done May 6th, 2005. We hereby affirm that Mr. Johan Rayati passport, Indonesian passport number, has been a client of our bank, 
1995 to 2005, the residential and business address given Mr. Riotti has been an exemplary customer of this bank during this period, whilst his dealings with the with the with the bank has been most honorable. Now remember this: they're talking about here a 9.8 trillion dollar account on deposit on account number such and such. Okay, so it goes through the due diligence that they've done on this account. They've cite various laws, the Patriot Act, among some of them treaties, criminal codes, etc. And here we go down to, they've done all this with full banking authority that all laws have been complied with and that the funds, assets listed above are or have been acquired by our client with good, clean, cleared funds of non-criminal origin. So is that pretty close, if not right on, to this funds of good, clean, clear, and non-criminal origin? So again... It would appear that the Federal Reserve is participating in their own frauds that they put on their website as represented to be frauds and scams. Now, there's one more that I want to we want to point out here, and that one has to do. We have to go back a little bit further, and this one's November 2007. Okay, so we just you just saw a due, affidavit of due diligence signed by. Alan Greenspan, who was at that time chairman of the Federal Reserve, and also his vice, I think it was the vice chairman, Roger Ferguson. And this involved Johans Riotti. He was an exemplary customer. He had $9.8 trillion in the bank, and his funds were of good, clean, clear, uh, non-criminal origin. Okay, well here, in November of 2007, two years later, they put up a fraud alert saying a scam involving Johans Riotti and Wilfredo Soren. Now you can read this. Basically what they're saying is that there is that they're aware of a, a fraudulent scam involving individuals using the names, okay, Riot, Johan Riotti and, and or Wilfredo Soren are persons claiming to be representatives of these two names, of <clears throat> these two men. Now, if you just read the headline, scam involving Johans Riotti or Wilfredo Soren, you would get the impression that Johans Riotti and or Wilfredo Soren are scammers. But then this is a little bit confusing when you read it because then it says, refers to people using those names or representatives of these two men. Okay. So now let's go. So let's go back to this SWIFT that we put up earlier, uh, sent on the 20th of April, 2009. It says, we, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, on behalf of our client, Mr. Wilfredo Soren, holder of Philippine passport, etc., 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 and you can read the rest of it. This is signed by Ben Bernanke, then chairman of the Federal Reserve. So what you have here is you have, in 2007, putting out a fraud re alert regarding Johan Riotti and Wilfredo Soren, in 2005, we see an affidavit of due diligence basically saying that Mr. Riotti has been an exemplary customer of this bank for 10 years. Then we see in 2009, two years later, that Wilfredo Soren is their client. Something's wrong, obviously. So I think any thinking person can figure out what's going on here. Okay, so let's get to the icing on the cake, and then we'll hit one more item, which will be the cherry on top, and we'll wrap this video up. Here is an interview with Jim Lehrer that Greenspan did after he put out a book sometime in the 2000s. I don't know when this was, but anyway, uh, listen closely. What is the uh, proper relationship? What should be the proper relationship between a chairman of the Fed and a president of the United States? Well, first of all, the Federal Reserve 
is an independent agency. And that means basically that uh, there is no ag other agency of government which can overrule actions that we take. So long as that is in place and there is no evidence that the administration or the Congress or anybody else is uh, requesting that we do things other than what we think is the appropriate thing, then what the relationships are uh, don't frankly matter. And uh, I've had uh, very good relationships with Today. presidents. So here we have Mr. Wizard, the guy behind the curtain who acts as a magician and can magically make your money disappear if you're sending $700 billion from the Bank of Taiwan to Wachovia Bank in the U.S., telling us that the Federal Reserve basically reports to no one. So the 1913 Act creating the Federal Reserve, over 100 years old now, we have an agency that is neither accountable to anyone. They create their own rules, oversee themselves, and don't have to report to anybody. So now I'm going to give you the cherry on top. We've given you the icing, now we're going to give you the cherry. And this will be significant to those accountants out there who understand financial statements and the auditing of same. This is the audit report for the years uh, 2017 and 2018 for the Federal Reserve Bank combined financial statements. And if we go down here to paragraph three, as described in note three to the combined financial statements, the di division of reserve bank operations and payment systems has prepared these combined financial s statements in conformity with the accounting principles established by the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System as set forth in financial accounting manual for Federal Reserve banks, which is a basis of accounting other than generally accepted accounting principles. Okay? So what you have is you have GAAP, which is general accepted accounting principles that applies to everybody else in the United States except the Federal Reserve. The principles that the Federal Reserve goes by are the ones that they have written themselves. Okay, so this brings us to the end of White Hat Report 48 Part 1 video. In it, we've discussed the Falcone theft that implicated two former presidents, a vice president, a secretary of state, and another sordid cast of characters, all of it amounting to RICO-level crimes. We also discussed a $700 billion transfer from China to the U.S. that was stolen en route, implicating the Federal Reserve. Finally, we illustrated a fraudulent $15 trillion transfer initiated by the Federal Reserve backed by 750,000 tons of gold that simply do not exist. And yet, none of these crimes has been investigated. At the end of our multi-part series, we'll also revisit the theft of Tropos Capital's $700 billion and the $15 trillion transfer and go into much greater detail. We've also documented how the Federal Reserve operates outside the law with no oversight, no accountability, rules made by them for them and used to protect them from their crimes against humanity. In future parts, we'll reveal the origins of the shadow government, the players and agencies of the government involved, the banks and the trusts and front companies used to control America and the rest of the planet. 
will give you an alternative look at history, exposing events that were either unreported or misreported by the cabal-owned media. We'll reveal names of bad actors you may not have heard of and events that took place in the shadows, out of public view, all orchestrated by the deep state. We'll talk more about the shadowy banking world involving the vast off-balance sheet accounts and how they're used to evade income taxes, fund black projects, and support private mercenary armies in addition to buying off politicians and funding wars. We hope you've enjoyed part one and ask that everyone like, subscribe, and share this video with everyone in your social media circle, in addition to mainstream media and elected representatives. The events we've described need to be investigated so that the criminality we've shown through our reports comes to an end and the responsible parties are arrested and held accountable. We'll see you next time. White Hats out.